Oh, I forgot to put my thing in. Oh, well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the T3 Alliance weekend, a week, weekly, weekly update on lessons. Today is lesson number four, uh, what can you do with a, a Raspberry Pi? And just, you know, thinking, thinking outside the box for a little bit here, if I'm a student and I've just sat down in your program for the summer course and maybe I did the brush bots and I am all excited about being a robotics person, I built the box. Oh my goodness, this is so exciting. I now have built my own computer. I feel awesome. Now's where you get to paint the picture a little bit of why this thing is so cool. So. We're going to go on a, a, a little journey here where I'll show you some, some of the, the awesome pictures and the, um, some example projects and we'll talk a little bit about how we frame this so that the students walking in say, okay, why is this thing cooler than my phone? Why is this thing, you know, really awesome? What is it about this thing that just really, you know, makes it worth my time to sit through being here with you uh, for the next however long you get to work with the students. So that being said, I'm gonna jump over and, and share a couple of the slides here that I've got. And I'm gonna, let's see, so here we are right there. What can you do with a pie? And I'm gonna present right here and then jump past a couple of my um, presentations. Now, next week, we're gonna learn a little bit about, uh, about, about programming because really, the whole thing about Raspberry Pi or any computer is the way that it takes input, does something with it, and does output afterwards. So I always start off this conversation with, um, with, well, in my favorite case, I found in Khan Academy, there's this awesome little video that was done by the people at code.org, what makes a computer a computer. And I'm gonna just play a few short clips of this a few short sections of this so that we can kind of watch it. And the link to this will be down below. My name is Mamie Koo, and I'm a designer and an inventor. Okay. So some of the things I've designed have been at Apple, and now I design products for kids to use so that they can have an easier time in school. My other jobs include DJing and dancing. Computers are everywhere. They're in people's pockets. They're in people's cars, we'll have them on their wrists, they might be in your backpack right now. But, what makes a computer a computer? What does make a computer a computer anyway? And how does it even work? Hi, I'm Nat. I was one of the original designers of the Xbox. I've been working with computers since I was maybe seven years old, uh, and now I work on virtual reality. Okay, this is all the kind of stuff that you, of course, would want to be, you know, getting your kids excited about. And look at how they do this presentation. They they go through and it's, it's you know, exciting to look at um, and they break it down into a really nice step-by-step -step capacity. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend the rest of your time here watching this show. You guys can follow the link on your own and I encourage you to to spend some time digging around on the code.org channel, the YouTube channel that's associated with, with uh, you know, how to teach basic computer science in this capacity. But um, they start with what every computer science course should start with, um, the, the fact that there's input, storage, processing, and output. And what we can do with the Raspberry Pi is go through and pick what your input source is going to be, if it's going to be your keyboard, if it's going to be um, a sound, if it's going to be uh, a, a well, whatever your input source is, the fact that the, the data can get stored, it can get processed, and get put out in some other capacity. This whole video goes through and talks about how this lady and the Xbox and the virtual reality, all of those things are examples of either input, output, and or the processing that went along with it. We have one more step that makes it even cooler, but it's still defined as an output where the data from this, from the Raspberry Pi oftentimes goes out into the cloud and you can look at it remotely. So that whole frame of Internet of Things, the IoT world, that's all in that same category. So do watch this. It's on your, you know, it's on your uh, link down below here. But I, 
you know, nobody can um, have been living in uh, our world for the last period of time without noticing how smart devices have come into our our consumer world. So that you know, if you wanted to go to Home Depot and spend money, or Home Depot or or any hardware store and spend money on an irrigation system that's automatic or have an appliance uh, like a refrigerator or something that notices when the milk is gone or that notices when the temperature has changed and it can send you an email or lighting how many people have heard of the oh hey Google could you turn on my lights oops sometimes I said hey Google and I actually turned on my own phone but thermostats blinds security cameras you can imagine there are a lot of things out there that are interacting with a network and they're sending that data uh, you know to, to make things easier for us and with the Raspberry Pi $35 computer we can do that for cheaper oftentimes than these other you know companies are selling stuff for so you know like here's a simple example this is one of the projects we'll be able to do right right away after the students spend a little time is make like here's a box of Kleenex and somebody's put a Raspberry Pi in there it's a little freaky to imagine somebody doing that but if you wanted to you could have that kind of home security system built in these things um, are called power tails and essentially what they allow you to do is if you had a Raspberry Pi that was hooked up to, to a Wi-Fi network and you told it to uh, take input from a speaker, take input from your phone, you send it an email, you do whatever, because it's plugged into uh, this, this power tail device, it will take 110 volt you know, current from the uh, regular outlet and it will tell it um, to either turn on or turn off something. So you could imagine a sign. Um, you know that's that's just one of the ways that a Raspberry Pi can be used so as your students are doing things within their community paying attention to things and thinking ah is that something that I could control with a Pi put it in line with any sort of a thing there are Raspberry Pi projects that we'll be doing here that are just fun joke projects you can make a simple uh, like a like a, a whoopee cushion or you can make uh, an arcade kind of a system where essentially all we've done is taken buttons uh, and a Raspberry Pi is really good at having those external little uh, GPIO pins, those little pins that point on there, and turn those into buttons. So if you have a button and a joystick and a screen, this one is made out of wood, and if you have access to a laser cutter, you could do that. But I've also seen ones that have been done with a, a DIY uh, set of cardboard and buttons that can be used. So there's another kind of a project that, that people have done. Um, this isn't necessarily a Raspberry Pi, but it, you could do the exact same thing with a Raspberry Pi where any kind of a bit of data that you collected, whether it's the temperature data or it's the d data from a, um, you know, the accelerometer on there. So, so if you drop the Pi or if you throw the Pi in a football or have the Pi uh, measuring pressure or temperature or anything, you could have it onto a scale. And that scale doesn't have to be a wooden printed scale, but it could be something else. And there's a little micro servo on there that connects up with with your Pi and you've controlled it. Um, there's the biomedical field. Holy cow! If we start thinking of all of the things, when you go to the doctor's office and you notice that they put you put your finger in this little finger sensor that measures the the uh, um, the amount of oxygen in your blood or that measures your pulse rate, um, this is a very a very uh, a field where the electronics that are associated with this tend to cost a little bit of money. But using Raspberry Pi technology, the Pi is $35. These little sensors are between $5 and $20 or $3 sometimes. And you can build them in a much simpler fashion. Here's a person I found who, build, who built a, a Raspberry Pi based Braille box. So how did that work? Somebody was able to program what the uh, words were on a screen and convert them into uh, three-dimensional buttons that pushed up and down. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, you know engineering that had to go in this. These little balls were on top of solenoids, um, but still, it's a need that was addressed. The Raspberry Pi jumped in and helped out. Here's a guy I found who who said, you know what? I think. The Raspberry Pi screen could be whatever, and I see how cool it is to have Google Glass or one of those kind of things that give you augmented reality. So this guy just wrapped a Raspberry Pi onto his head and has a little screen that drops down so he can see things in a more certain capacity. 
I don't know what the need was other than just being cool, but sometimes that's enough for kids to see, oh, okay, um, there's something cool out there. Let's look at one more step forward. This is a Raspberry Pi, which also has night vision goggles on it. So, holy cow, if you had a Raspberry Pi, you had a night vision camera, and you could somehow attach it so that you could see with it as you walked around. Um, I'm sure those things cost a lot if you bought them on the open market, and you can buy them on the open market, I'm sure. But uh, if, if a student had a need for it, they could build something that could adapt their own sense of perspective to it. In the agriculture field wow there's a lot of possible projects that are out there a lot of things that have been done so uh, I'll just show you a few of them this is an automatic watering project so essentially there's a Raspberry Pi and when the and when the 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 soil gets dry enough it loses electrical conductivity and it triggers a little electronic pump that pumps water to until that electrical conductivity goes back to a a stable base rate. You could imagine taking this same exact idea and switching it over to anything that can be measured with a sensor. So if I've got a hydroponic system or if I have some sort of a potassium selective you know or an ion selective electrode, some sort of a sensor that can pick up the amount of something that's in the you know in the soil or in the in the in the in the, the growing medium, then I can add new stuff into it. So again, this isn't the first time it's ever been invented. Probably we could go on to garden.com or something and we could find this kind of thing. But in this situation, a farmer could have a problem, somebody in your community could have a problem, and we could address the need with the kind of technology that your students have hold of right there. Here's a egg in incubator, very simple. All it is is a, uh, uh, a, a, a styrofoam cooler with a temperature meter in there and a little uh, LCD screen and if if the eggs need to be incubated at just a certain temperature then then that could be controlled from this kind of a thing and what we can't see here but is probably also possible is that uh, is that a person could be sending this data to their phone so that if an egg hatched or if uh, if if something drastic changed then they could get an alert come on there this is a a much more fancy one that's actually being done by a farmer I found that it has an irrigation system on there um, associated with their their crops so there's a Raspberry Pi that bases it and then a whole bunch of control switches that turn on and off sprinkler systems and the farmer can look at it on his phone and or whatever and and manage it in that kind of capacity there are uh, you know ways that kids could come up with a how to make a uh, a humane rat trap or some sort of a way that you could you know capture something here in Hawaii uh, we have farmers who constantly complain about pigs and one of the the jobs that our students are working on is how do I keep pigs out of my out of my garden so they're trying to figure out a, a motion sensing camera that somehow turns on some sonic something that only pigs can hear and makes pigs say oh I don't really feel like ruining this farmer's crops today, I'm going to go to the next door neighbor's place or somewhere else. Here's a, uh, a wildlife camera with object recognition. Whoa, that's kind of cool. So um, you can actually use, and, and um, you've all heard about this on, on you know, smartphones now, that you can just smile at the smartphone and it recognizes your face. There are facial recognition technology things that we can download, we can add to it, and we can... Um, and we can make as part of the, the process. Um, um, so in this scenario, if a bird lands, then maybe we know that it's a particular bird. If uh, you know something else comes around, then then it can land. Hey, I have a I have a special guest that I'm just gonna introduce here real quick. This guy over here is is Daryl. He's just coming into Chester's shop here, and he's a former computer science major, and I, I, I asked him to swing by and tell us a little bit after we're finished, after I'm finished going through some of the what can be done with Raspberry Pis, and he'll, uh, he'll, he'll tell us a little bit about some of the things. He knew about the fact that he was going to be on screen before he got here, so don't worry. I'm not throwing him under the bus, but uh, cool. here we go. So, so wildlife camera with object recognition. You could imagine any forester person, anybody out in your community who's doing anything really cool with with uh, with monitoring wildlife would be excited to hear about a project like this. So again, not very expensive. It's just let's set it up and, and make it happen and give it wild or 
give it access to Wi-Fi. Here's a, a project I found. Somebody had a, a very real question of, how's my oil heating level? So there's a little sonic sensor attached to a Raspberry Pi, and when this thing uh, is tilted down, they can use the sonic sensor to get a, a measurement of how high is my oil level. And in the event that you were living in a place like Alaska, where in the rural Alaska, where you needed to fill up your oil tank every time it got to a certain level, um, and oil gets oftentimes burned in a furnace so that you can heat things up, then uh, then you could get an email or you could get a text or you could even make it in such a way that it sent a a, a note to the to the guy in town who did the automatic oil service filling up thing with his truck. So another idea. Then there's all of the things that could be done with a Pi and something that moves. So the Pi is a small little computer that has those, you know, those output input devices things. So in this scenario, here's somebody who's taken a Raspberry Pi and built a drone with it. So four little motors and the Pi has has um, an accelerometer or no, it, it the Pi doesn't have an accelerometer on it, does it? It does not. But does you can not. add on. But we can add on. So you could add on an accelerometer. An accelerometer, just for those of you who don't no, it means the way your cell phone, when you turn it sideways, it can rotate the screen because it notices that that you've just changed it in that direction. It's kind of like a gyroscope sort of a thing, but in an electrical fashion. So anyway, simple drones could be built. These drones could carry all sorts of sensors that then could be brought back to you know your community for some other purpose or reason. But that's that's cool in its own right. I found a. a a Raspberry Pi surveillance rover. I'm not positive whether this Raspberry Pi surveillance rover moves around on its own balance, like 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 a Segway kind of a of a thing, or whether or not there's a third wheel hiding behind it. If I went through that process and we tried to building it, then we might be able to find out a little bit more. Um, uh, building a simple Raspberry Pi bot, one where it just turns batteries, moves around, and it can be controlled by your your phone, or it can be controlled by any sort of a capacity where you can give it a, a pre-destination. Last year when we had uh, lava flows here in Hawaii, and the, there was a subdivision where it was too dangerous to send people down there, but it was paved streets. It would have been really nice to have something like this that could have driven around and gone and collected air quality samples for our scientists or for our community members who wanted to know just how good or how bad is the air quality. Here's something I saw that your kids might think is just awesome. Somebody built a Raspberry Pi electric skateboard. Now, you have to know the Raspberry Pi isn't the guts of this thing, but it is the control center. So this person is probably holding some sort of a little remote control device, maybe a phone, maybe a little thing he did. And then somewhere down here is a whole bunch of batteries, a bunch of motors, and a Raspberry Pi that says, let's, let's, let's make that work it the way it is. must be a lot cheaper than uh, an official yeah. electric skateboard. Yeah, I wonder how much an electric skateboard is. I, I, I could probably Google that. <laughs> uh, close to a thousand. Close to a thousand. Crazy. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So so if this doesn't excite your students, um, students, would you love to build low cost transportation devices in order to meet some need in our community? Well, they could probably think of some need that they'd have. Um, oh, this this is. I accidentally put this in the wrong place, but another Internet of Things based health monitoring system. Many of us have smartwatches nowadays. I've got uh, one of these smartwatches and he's got a Fitbit. The kind of data that those guys collect and send about your heart rate, all that kind of stuff to to a cloud and whether or not you choose to share that information or not is up to you. But the, the reality is you don't always have to go through that kind of uh, avenue now. You could have a Raspberry Pi that's collecting your heart rate, that's collecting your GPS location, that's collecting anything that you choose to share and your students can help engineer that in order to answer a community question like that. So um, of course weather stations. This is a simple kind of weather station where there's a little electric box and an anemometer up here, a weather vane. But then you also remember we've got the weather station that's right up here that, or this isn't a weather station, is an air quality station, sort of similar to that. So measuring our environmental science in that kind of a capacity is what we're talking about. Oh, this is one of my favorite ones. It is the Raspberry Shake. And what's happened here is there's a little Raspberry Pi that's underneath here, and this this thing that this blue that's on top is a is a uh, like a little sensor board, and there's a small little seismometer right there. And if this thing gets mounted somewhere with real time connection to the internet, then it'll record all of the vibrations that go along with it, and by itself. 
it's kind of cool. You can do things like say, how big was something? How big was that earthquake? How big was the jump that all my students did in the classroom? Or how big was the, um, you know, was the applause? Or if I did a little explosion or all sorts of things. At University of Michigan, they applied one of these things by putting it uh, in the, in the, in the stadium and when they had this many people in the stadium the people could scream and yell and stomp their feet and they could register an actual seismic tremor that they uh, then transmitted that data out here onto the big screen and it was kind of like an applause meter or a, a cloud meter it's kind of cool uh, one of the uses for a seismometer that might not be known about this though to me is like this is the bomb of why having little devices like this that can send data out to a cloud when they send devices data out to a cloud on a one by one basis that's cool i can check the status of my house i can check whether or not some animal has gone by a certain camera but when i can see a whole network of data where all of the data starts being looked at at the same time then something even cooler happens Oop, i missed that one let me go back and hit play and let's see so there it is there was an earthquake that occurred and all of these little things represent seismic stations. And as the earthquake occurred in Mexico, some of Gulf of California, look at how each of these things vibrated in relationship to each other. Each one of these guys is going up and down in sequence. That's the P waves, S waves, it's basic, basic earthquake uh, seismology as it moves through. And you could have a bunch of these things in a region and you could see a trend as something moved across. If we did on a different scale and said let's do pollution or let's do uh, you know a cold front you could have weather sensors all across the country where you could map the pressure as it moved in real time and see a dynamic set of stuff that goes along with it so kinda cool sonic pi you know I was just looking for ideas here but sonic pi seems like it's a way you can make your pi play music uh, Daryl you ever heard of this kind of thing? Uh, no. So anyway, it's out there. Somebody thinks it's really cool. Those musician people. Um, I'm not one of those people, so I, I, I can't can't say much about it. But it seems from the research that that like you can create a backbeat and all sorts of things by you know making your your you know program things. I saw this because I thought you know how many people know somebody with a cat? Probably it's one of those universally defining things across the country. Cats exist, and if there are people who have a problem of man, I hate feeding my cat. I wish there was just an easier way to do it. Well, here are people who have taken a Raspberry Pi and used it to feed their cat on an automatic level. So there must be some kind of a sonic sensor in there. But if the kids don't think this is cool, um, well, uh, you could have, you could even have a cat cam. <laughs> I just think of all the, all the stuff you could do with that. Maybe a, a, a toy for the cat to play with. Yes, yes, a toy for the cat to play with, an automated toy. A or a timer. Yeah. yeah. To do um, Here's Netflix. here's like a cheap person's GoPro. I'm not sure. You know, uh, a, a a Raspberry Pi is about is about <laughs> thirty five bucks. That does not look waterproof. <laughs> it doesn't look waterproof, does it? No. So there's yeah, there's like a little jump drive in there or something. Maybe it's a sensor and a camera. I just I was looking for different types of projects that people would think is cool. Here's a person who said, you know, I'm going to put a battery bank and a, a little GPS sensor on there and I'm going to track my, my driving around town on my bicycle so I can make a, you know, a bicycle map. There is a place where, where, where the Raspberry Pi doesn't necessarily need to be limited to just driving small little motors for like that little robot. There's actually a project where people are using it uh, to be the brains behind a full on, uh, a full on electric vehicle. So that's one. Um, in this program, in T3 Alliance program, we will get to the point where we'll use Raspberry Pi to build autonomous systems where we use sensors, we use GPS, and we use, you know, like control mechanisms to move things around. But pretty much it all boils down to inputs and outputs. And uh, if, if the students finish this, this like little talk story lesson, talk story is a word in Hawaiian that we use to say when you just talk about stuff when they finish this and come up with sharing ideas what if you did this what if you did this what if you did this hopefully you have primed the pump for for okay let's learn what's the first thing we have to learn and that's probably going to be basic programming skills but before before I, I I basic programming skills is for next week but Daryl has spent 
his uh, his um, last four years as a computer science major, and then he's gone off and done. Uh, and he's graduated now, and he's and he's a former upper bound student, and he's gone off and worked for NASA at like one of his internship pro projects. And he follows the subreddit category of what's going on with Raspberry Pi projects. Is there anything you like to share that just you know impressed you or that seems cool about Pies? They're really inexpensive, and the limits are well limitless. Um, I've worked on uh, several projects using the Raspberry Pi. One really neat one years ago was uh, using uh, Raspberry Pi to control the shutter doors on one of the uh, observatories on Mauna Kea. Oh, cool. So instead of having like an embedded system, you could just have the Raspberry Pi control, all of that fun stuff. Wow. It's pretty nifty. Um, it's also been used in like robotics, uh, for example, when it comes to communicating uh, communication and uh, navigation. Robotics has, uh, the robotics program that, that I was a part in utilized the Raspberry Pi platform a lot. Huh. It's to control the motors, the uh, navigation, the communication, as well as autonomy. And and you used uh, programming languages like what for those kind of things? Python, C. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, next week when when we jump into the pro world of programming, it'll be you know understanding that there's a whole bunch of different ways of communicating and controlling how the computer takes those inputs, does whatever it does with them, and then outputs it in whatever form that's most useful for the end user. And, you know, is his example of being up on one of the telescopes that we have here in Hawaii and turning doors open and closed or, or anything else, it's, it's the force or the power goes to the person who can control and who understands the language that's being used as it's moving from one place to another, as that, as that information is passing. So, cool. Um, are there any questions we've got coming in our channel or anything? No? All right. Oh, we'll, I have a question, though. Oh, yeah, go for um, it. Can you do video with the cameras? Yes. Oh yes, you definitely yeah, can. Okay. Yes, yeah. both stills and videos. Yeah, cool. and you can, and and we'll we'll have a lesson a little later on where we we uh, we helps help uh, people build those cameras and play with uh, the functionalities. There's there's um, there's a project we have right now where we've got time lapse photos on a garden where we're watching the garden plants grow bigger and bigger. And if we wanted to, we could switch it in the video. It becomes a storage capacity question of how are you going to get that data where you want it to go to and how is it going to be meaningful for your end user? So those are good questions for a student at this point to be wrestling with. What's, what's the end purpose? I'm making videos uh, or making um, you know, a data set that, that needs to be interpreted in some kind of capacity. And oftentimes there are scientists and their community members out there who'd love to help with the data interpretation, but they have no clue on how to do the, you know, the programming stuff. So your students are carrying a really big uh, responsibility and a power to be able to say, I can do the programming stuff mm -hmm. if you can help me with the data analysis. And there's a lot of ways to, in other words, skin the cat. Um, uh, another way to stream video surveillance would be to compress it by uh, using a codec like H.264. H. Yeah, H.264. Um, that basically uh, lowers your capacity, storage capacity requirements, um, requiring lower storage devices. So instead of storing raw and pay for images, you just store right. the compressed images instead. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could as in this program and some of the next lessons we'll be doing everybody does the same activity so uh, when we make a selfie station selfie station is a button and it's a uh, a camera and you could modify that button and camera to become a trail cam you could modify it to become a security system you could modify it to become a cat cam whatever you want it to be it's pretty much the same guts but it's just reframed into the purpose that it's needed to and so you know you're really teaching some key basic projects that can morph into a bunch of different ways. And once uh, a user has played enough with messing around with, you know, how to see one input as any other input, as long as it's going into that GPIO pin, um, then having the output go to the cloud or go to a storage, a hard drive storage system or whatever it goes to, it's all, it's all uh, pretty interchangeable. So, so, yeah. I think one major important thing that students pick up from using a Raspberry Pi is how do they build a structured program, for example. Um, by definition, a structured program is a, you know, a list of, of commands 
that the computer runs in order to achieve a certain goal. Mm. Like if you want to, if you want to do surveillance uh, video, you follow the steps of getting the video feed from the camera acting as input. Then you store it out as an output to a storage device, mm. whether it's a cloud-based or a local-based storage. Right. So basically, they want the structure of how to get from one point to the other and achieving that goal of video surveillance right. as a scenario. And they do that in our program with some of the example projects we're going to put forward. But it's going to be up to you guys to say, my own community has blank. Maybe if I'm in northern Vermont, we need maple syrup right. monitoring projects if I'm in. Right, you could take the measurements as an input. And, you know, right. The output could either be a storage device for analysis or it could be something that triggers a device to do something. Right. Cool. Well, thank you, Daryl, for joining us today. And thank you to everybody out there on, uh, on our channel. And uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. Next week, we'll dive into the world of, of let's learn basic programming skills. So all right. I guess I'll be a part of that. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you all later on this.